Welcome to Fertility and Sterility on Air, the podcast where you can stay current on the latest global research in the field of reproductive medicine. This podcast brings you an overview of this month's journal, in-depth discussion with authors, and other special features. FNS on Air is brought to you by Fertility and Sterility Family of Journals in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and is hosted by Dr. Kurt Barnhart, Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eve Feinberg, Editorial Editor, Dr. Micah Hill, Media Editor, and Dr. Pietro Bordaletto, Interactive Associate-in-Chief. Welcome to Journal Club Global from ESHRAE. Today we are going to be talking about the paper Recurrent Implantation Failure, Reality or a Statistical Mirage. This is going to be a discussion of the consensus statement from the July 1st, 2022 Lugano Workshop on Recurrent Implantation Failure. This is Eve Feinberg. I am joined by... Ann Steiner. Dominique Ziegler. Paul Pertair. Boris Attar. Ricardo Sumillano. Welcome, and I'm looking forward to a robust discussion. We are happy to talk to you about an issue of clinical concern. We now have excellent pregnancy rates, but we have to manage better the failures. Uh, we have the opportunity of having Anne Steiner, the editor in chief of Fertility and Civility Reviews to actually give you an outlook of the publication that just came out on recurrent implantation of failure. This is a uh, report of a meeting that was held a year ago in Lugano and the floor is yours. Thank you. So as we know, implantation rates of euploid embryos are approximately 65% and thus 35% of euploid embryos fail to implant. So along the way, we have developed a concept or a, a terminology called re -implant, recurrent implantation failure, which occurs after a failure of multiple ART cycles. But unfortunately, there appears to be absence of consensus on the actual clear definition, whether this is live birth, sustained implantation, positive HCG, hence Lugano workshop. For the rest of the discussion today, the definition in general has been, or that for the conference, they use the definition of a failure to establish a sustained implantation after ART, um, that is a gestational sac, and they focused on euploid transfer after um, a programmed FET cycle. Uh, the Lugano uh, workshop was a conference of uh, U.S. and European experts, a total of 27, and it was funded by IBSA. Um, they conducted a full literature search, and then subsequently the articles were reviewed and summarized. From there, um, they um, basically um, tried to come with a definition for recurrent implantation failure, or RIF, um, historically, it was um, more than 10 high-quality embryos transferred without a implantation, although some people, or a sustained implantation, although some people did feel that it should be a combination of number of transferred and female age. Uh, there was a survey published a number of years ago showing that there is lack of a um, formal definition. And when we looked at it statistically, the paper pointed out that 4.5% of patients will have R RIF um, if you define it as three failed euploid embryo transfers. It's also pointed out um, that the implantation rate is relatively stable across three cycles um, based on modeling and observational data. And uh, it was pointed out that the true RIF likelihood is probably around one to 5%. Um, and uh, amongst uh, euploid transfers, and amongst untested, it's probably closer to around 9%. Uh, so for this, basically, um, they were then also trying to um, um, come up with a definition of um, RIF in this setting where PGTA was not performed. As we mentioned, the definition was recommended of three failed euploid transfers, but not everybody does PGTA. And the recommendation was to um, base that on 
the number of embryos transferred um, and the woman's age and her likelihood of aneuploidy, such that, for example, a woman less than 35 would have RIF after the transfer of four, euploid, uh, four untested embryos, whereas a woman uh, between the ages of 41 and 42 who would have a 70% aneuploidy rate would have RIF after the transfer of 13 uh, untested em embryos. They went on to also talk about uh, statistical outliers and should we use that as the definition. And once again, if we use statistical outliers, which is the upper 95th percentile, once again, we get three euploid embryo uh, transfers as the definition for uh, recurrent implantation failure. The paper then went on to summarize possible causes of uh, RIF, and uh, some of these that they explored were the possibility of oocyte cohort effects, specifically noting of interest the association between fertilization rate and implantation rate, interestingly noting um, the prior studies showing that fertilization rate is actually correlated with implantation rate. And interesting, also noted a prior study showing that a woman um, or a couple having a triploid, em an embryo with triploidy or uh, uh, uniparental, uniparental disomy, um, even if in the other normal embryos will have a lower implantation rate for the entire cohort, suggesting that there may be overall an oocyte cohort effect. They also went on to talk about uh, uterine or endometrial factors such as communicating hydrocelpinges that we know decrease the odds of sustained implantation. Also, uterine cavity distorting lesions, um, and uh, of note pointing out a recent R R RCT that showed that routine use of hysteroscopy does not increase the odds of sustained implantation. The paper also reviews endometrial receptivity assays, um, which has had a numerous recent also um, reviews and publications out, um, but specifically talking about the known window of uh, receptivity, which we know to be uh, with a day three embryo transfer between three to five days of progesterone use and day five embryo transfer between five and seven days of use of um, uh, progesterone supplementation. However, uh, it is noted that currently um, as the uh, group noted that current receptivity assays such as ERA and BCL6 testing um, do not have definitive data showing that they uh, personalized embryo transfers improved uh, implantation rates. The group also uh, talked about or discussed um, endometrial thickness, um, the endometrial biome, and uh, progesterone supplementation, uh, specifically stating that uh, while we know endometrial thickness is important, um, the concept of uh, absolute cutoff is not very uh, has not been well defined, or there's not conclusive data, and that there's inconclusive data at this time point regarding the endometrial biome, and given the uh, divergence of results and the issue, methodologic issues this needs further study before clinical application. Uh, the group went on also to, as I mentioned, to look at progesterone uh, supplementation and programmed FET cycles, focusing largely on vaginal supplementation and the importance or the uh, value of progesterone levels on day of embryo transfer, specifically stating that uh, uh, progesterone levels less than 10 nanograms per milliliter were associated with lower implantation rates in the setting of vaginal progesterone use. Um, did not uh, belabor the topic further, um, the other areas further, and allow us to move on discussion. I'll just summarize the, uh, quickly the other areas that were covered, um, not only metabolic factors, male factors, the use of ART add-ons, um, including immunologic thr and thrombophilia testing, and along with them endometrial scratching, in general concluding, concluding that there is lack of sufficient uh, data to support their use. So in summary, I would say that this was an excellent paper summarizing the findings of the Lugano consensus or, or meeting group um, that basically provided us with a uh, definition that can be used 
uh, for for excuse me, recurrent implantation failure, uh, uh, helping us come to a standardized definition of um, three failed uh, euploid embryo transfers, or if with untested embryos to base it on the underlying aneuploidy rate, and then given us some ideas as to how to uh, potentially evaluate and approach um, recurrent implantation failures. So from there, we'll move on to asking the group some questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anne, very much. We have a panel of discussants who are going to make their own comments uh, on this paper and possibly ask questions. Uh, please, uh, Tadon, go ahead. Good morning. Thank you. Well, I think that this paper is a starting point. And the, the field of uh, reproductive implantation failure is very complicated and there are several papers uh, confusing, contrasting. And so there was the need to clean the table and start again. And this paper is the starting point in this sense so that we have shared, um, we have shared the definition of um, risk that would be important for both the patients at home and the researchers because it will give the opportunity to design studies that can give an answer. Nonetheless, even if this was the main objective, I have also to say that uh, the very recent uh, publications have suggested that this condition is much less frequent than we thought in the past. In fact, we can uh, assume, based on the study that was published in Fertility Studies in 2021, that reef may be very, very rare to the point to think that maybe it does not exist. But this is, as I said, a starting point. This is only one paper. We need more paper, but at least we have shared a vision. And according to me, this is really the first and the most important step. Then in the next years, we will reach um, the, the conclusions on that condition. Thank you, Dado. I think uh, those comments are very important because women actually come to an IVF uh, they have their transfer, the biologist tells them the embryo is beautiful and uh, the woman is likely to believe that if it doesn't work, and sometimes it does not, if it doesn't work, it comes from her. So we have to go further into the discussion and I will pass the microphone on to Parish. Okay. Thank you. To Let's put it this way. I mean, everything in life should be purposeful. Now, it should serve a purpose. Recurrent implantation failure as a term should, you know, what would its purpose be? It should, it should define a point where I would consider additional tests that I wouldn't do on a treatment naive patient, right? Or from a therapeutic perspective, I should consider additional interventions that I wouldn't offer in the first place. So that would be the function of a term like recurrent implantation failure. If it meant you know, this, there's something wrong with this couple that I wasn't able to diagnose initially or I wasn't able to treat initially. But we know today you know, the, the foremost reason, the most common reason of transfer failure is randomly occurring aneuploid and it's affected by female age. And a common problem with earlier definitions is I think they were really too lenient. I mean, we would start calling people recurrent implantation failure after having failed just two, three embryo transfers, which could easily happen just by you know, random unemployed. And then this, um, this encourages people, that stresses them out, may increase the risk of like dropping out from treatment, whereas they have reasonable chance in the next round if they continue. So the most important point made by this paper and this meeting is, I think, you know, um, bringing this sort of thinking um, into the light, should I say, or like to, to attention of the profession. So that would decrease the stress on physicians as well as the couples. So thank you, Anne, for the summary you made. I think it was very com comprehensive. I just wonder whether, after reading the paper, you have some questions that you'd like to address the participants? Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I did. I um, really like the mathematical modeling and uh, asking, you know, how you came up with 
the definition of um, RF after three failed euploid transfers and looking at basing this on um, how many people will have not will not have a sustained implantation after three fail after three embryo transfers and um, I just wondered how do you deal when you're doing this kind of modeling with the concept that those people that drop out or don't continue with treatment may be different than those people that do continue treatment and how would that affect your um, decisions or modeling or or did you think about that or is that something that needs to be considered? Um, all right so the mathematical model is to explain the concepts okay, so if the only problem was unemployed which happens at random and everything else was normal now you can calculate what would have happened. So then if the actual numbers do not meet your expectations, then you start suspecting there's something else. It, it doesn't necessarily inform the figures you would have in your clinic. So it is, it is, it's just to make the concept. And it's relevant for Paul's paper, the, the second part of your question, I mean, whether there are any differences, systematical differences between women who come for a second transfer versus who doesn't. Okay. So I'll, I'll ask him to comment, but in general, from the epidemiological perspective, if there is a you know, reasonable expectation that people who drop out versus who continue are systematically different, would you, would you expect such a difference biologically? So why would one drop out whereas the other one continues? So what I can think of is, you know, it could be financial constraints when it's not funded by the government or insurance. Um, they're... You know, like IVF really requires a lot of resilience. So they may be different in that regard, but I don't think it would affect their embryos. And I think women with better ovarian reserve who can produce more embryos in one cycle are more likely to continue. But as the definition regards only after an embryo transfer, these are probably irrelevant. So I wouldn't expect you know, a systematic difference between who have a subsequent transfer or not. I don't know how Paul thinks about it. I fully agree. And actually, uh, to make it more easier, I, I thank God that we have managed to succeed. I mean, managed to get all these people together, and that share more or less the same vision. And I think that the, this new, let's say, proposition of definition could provide a base, a fundamental baseline for research. Because in order to make research on this topic, uh, we need this kind of uh, definition in order for us to be able to assess literature, in order to assess uh, treatments and the efficacy of treatments. Edgardo? Yes, I think that you touch a really important point because the problem of dropout uh, in fact, hampers uh, the, the use of uh, the clinical use of this definition because you know you, are, you have in front patients, and uh, this is a model, and most of patients will not be able to to achieve uh, the, the definition. But on the other hand, as Paul underlined, this has opened also the possibility to doing research and. The results that will emerge from that research will be used also for patients at their first attempt. So if you will be able to find something that can interfere with implantation, obviously we will study and treat it before embarking in IVF. So coming back to the, my first comment, it's really a starting point. So it's not the final, uh, the final um, answer, but it is uh, the beginning. My question, I think these are all excellent points, but my question was you didn't just look at modeling of data, but there was also some looking at whether or not there was dilution of outcomes looking at SART data and looking at whether or not the likelihood of embryo transfer success decreased with subsequent embryo transfers. And so the thought was that if you had a population of true recurrent implantation failure, that on transfer number two and transfer number three, those would be enriched and you would have worse likelihood of success in subsequent transfers. Can you comment a little bit more on that? Yes, that's a great question because actually uh, um, 
the SART data since 2020 and 2021 shows two successive ML transfer results with a delta of 6.1 to 6.8 percent. So it seems that the rate don't decrease by much. Whereas, for example, if we were to have a persistent endometrial factor that could hamper implantation, in the second ML transfer, you should have a bigger drop off than on the first one because this population will reach the next one that will perform a new ML transfer. Now, in our study, uh, the first one that we did uh, in, in New Jersey, we showed a, a very slight decrease of less than 5% over successive ember transfers. That doesn't really apply with the uh, curve that will actually, for example, uh, mimic 5% or 10%. So in our belief, uh, we kind of think that it's even less than 5 by how much I hope bearish data will provide light on that in the future. Uh, so yes, if there were to be a uh, persistent uh, implantation failure cause that will decrease by a lot the results in the second and the third one and this has not been, been supported by evidence. Yeah, so one other question and I think my big question to you as a group is where do you go from here in terms of once you've established that the patient falls into that one to five percent of recurrent implantation failure where do we go from there do you do further diagnostic evaluation to look at what might be an etiology of recurrent implantation failure do you think about something like egg donation or gestational surrogacy where do you envision that that population of patients who truly fail multiple euploid embryo transfers would be best served in order to have the highest likelihood of success Um, so, to, inspired by the initial study by Paul, so at the meeting we discussed, you know, what would happen with the fourth deployed and blastocyst? When with, what would happen with the fifth? I mean, if they also maintain, if they also maintain the same implantation rates, you know, then the definition would drastically change. So we collected data which we recently submitted to SRM. It's recently accepted, so I can disclose now. So the fourth and the fifth have the same rate with the second and the third. So and if you expand the graph, once you exclude obvious reasons like hydrosalpinges, intracavitary problems, I mean, pater like parental chromosomal abnormalities, right? So the cumulative live birth rate reached to 99%, right? So the problem, the difficulty is getting the correct embryo. So if someone is able to, if a couple is able to produce embryos, and if they wish to continue, then you know, we can encourage people to continue. I mean, otherwise, you know, like stopping them from treatment would be arbitrary. I guess my question is continue up until what point? Is there a certain number, a certain threshold where we can confidently say that you're throwing your embryos away. For example, I saw a patient last week who came to see me as a second opinion. She had done eight egg retrieval cycles and transferred a total of 11 euploid embryos, and she still had four euploid embryos remaining. Would you at this point say, like, this is true recurrent implantation failure, stop transferring your embryos, and should she have stopped transferring her embryos five embryos ago? Well, yes, uh, I think that this case is a real re repetitive implantation failure because uh, uh, it goes well beyond uh, the, the hypothetical limit. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is that this model is really theoretical. So at the end, we are, uh, for instance, excluding uh, embryonic cause of repetitive implantation failure. This is an important point because maybe there are women who are unable to produce euploid blastocysts. And the second issue, the second uh, weakness of that model is that it tends to consider reproductive implantation failure as a yes or no condition, while probably in reality there is a, a, a gradient of the capacity of an endometrium to, to accept the implant. And therefore, maybe there are some uh, endometrium that are not capable of uh, accepting uh, mosaicin, uh, whereas others can accept also mosaicin and therefore can give a pregnancy earlier. So 
uh, really it, it's a starting point. For sure your patient uh, has a problem. So, but since it is a very rare problem in medicine, I think that in general we have to follow protocols. But sometimes you find an outlier and this woman is an outlier. And when you have an outlier, you have to, to you are allowed to invent, to try to think, to imagine something that can overcome our problems. But the problem in this case is there for sure. Yeah, and I think what these data do a really good job of demonstrating is for that patient that fails one or two, her first or second euploid transfer, it's not the time to do a hysteroscopy or another hysteroscopy if she's already had a hysteroscopy. It's not the time to start intralipid, testing natural killer cells, IVIG. And I think these data make a really reassuring point to these women or these patients, keep on going. The statistical probability is by that third euploid embryo transfer, you will go on to have a live birth. I'd like to mention one fact. So all diploid blastocysts are not the same. Okay? So it depends on, on which day it's blastulated. Okay? So what is its morphological grade? An diploid blastocyst that blastulated on day seven and has, let's say, the 3 BC has almost half the potential, actually less than half the potential of another diploid which blastulated on day five, which is, say, 5 AA. Okay? So we should factor these things into our expectations as well. And regarding the patient you asked, I mean, when we were doing the, the study, it's not possible everywhere, but under a government-funded scenario, we, we had a patient who delivered, after nine euploid failures, the 10th euploid blastocyst. So again, I mean, that patient probably has a chance, but whether it's worth trying the next transfer financially, emotionally, etc., would depend on you know, the quality of the blastocyst you have. But what I think... It, the paper nicely shows is we all feel under stress. I mean, both as physicians, I mean, embryologists and the patients. So people ask for new thing. So the paper reviews, you know, what is commonly regarded in the literature. And I think gives us a, a resource to tell people, you know, why they are not required or how they do not help. And, you know, you should save your time, money, and a morale for the next trial, rather than these uncertain interventions, which may even later turn out to be harmful, like the receptivity tests, perhaps. Yeah, and I think one thing that these data are also really helpful in my perspective is when counseling a patient initially, framing this as a treatment course that we would fully anticipate within your third embryo transfer that you would become pregnant. And I often liken it to giving an antibiotic. You don't give one pill of an antibiotic and expect that an infection is cured. It's really you take a three-day course or a five-day course of antibiotics and cumulatively the infection is cured. And so I think we need to change how we counsel patients. We need to get away from this embryo looks perfect, your endometrium looks perfect. I think that there really is no such concept and we really need to think about it as a cumulative likelihood over a set number of embryos. What you just said, Eve, is absolutely perfect. The essence of the message that is conveyed by this article is that in general, the uterus is receptive if the proper investigation has been done up front. And so therefore, people have to be made aware of that. However, IVF doesn't work all the time. There are issues that are sporadic. The transfer itself, transferring the embryos is difficult and you can be uh, more or less lucky in terms of how the transfer is being performed. But whatever happens at the time of the transfer it will not repeat itself. This is a sporadic event. In terms of receptivity, what the study has shown is that by and large, by and large, the endometrial receptivity is correct in 95% of the patients. Unfortunately, there are things that we still do not entirely understand. There are patients who are extremely unlucky such as there are others who are extremely lucky. And then there are possibly issues that we don't understand. But for the majority of cases, the animation is receptive. People have to be reassured about that. 
And they have to also be made aware of the fact that there are two ways of failing IVF. One way is to have a failed IVF cycle, but the second way is to actually abandon the treatment. And people have to be aware of that. Others have abandoned, and if others have abandoned, they may abandon as well. And they have to protect themselves for the water coaster of emotions that go uh, during an IVF cycle, and they have to protect themselves because they have to keep on trying in order to fulfill their parenthood project. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, webinar, which we transmitted uh, directly from the ASHRAE uh, Symposium uh, in uh, Copenhagen, in Denmark. This concludes our episode of Fertility and Sterility on Air, brought to you by Fertility and Sterility in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. This episode was produced by Dr. Michael Simone and Dr. Molly Cornfield. This podcast was developed by Fertility and Sterility and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While the podcast reflects the views of the authors and the hosts, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to direct an exclusive course of treatment. The opinions expressed are those of the discussants and do not reflect fertility and sterility or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine.